everyone. Welcome. Welcome to anyone who's joining us online as well. Um, do you have any visitors today who would like to introduce themselves? Okay, we welcome any of you who are visiting today. Um, a few announcements. First of all, since I'm rather new here, um, I thought we'd try out this um, thing that, that uh, Kathy Clark did before called Tables for Eight, where we have small groups get together, and at some point we can do it in people's homes, but I thought I would host the first couple of meetings and we do it right here and just have a chance to sit down in a small group and talk about oh, life and uh, all the all the things going on in the world and but to organize a little time like that so there's sign up sheets out here um, I, have a, I picked a couple of dates in November and then after the Christmas holidays we'll, we'll resume it again um, so if anybody wants to sign up for those uh, there's a date Friday the 24th and Thursday the 30th of the month um, I would like to uh, take a moment to say a big thank you to Ed. I don't know if you've noticed, but there was a dead tree out behind the parsonage, which has been cut down and turned into firewood, which is available for if anybody needs some firewood there for a collection. Ed's been doing a lot of work. He's done that. He's raked up the leaves across the street. He's painted the parsonage, which now has a tenant in it, which is wonderful for the church. So big thank you to Ed for a lot, a lot of work that he's put into it. So much appreciated. Yeah. Um, another announcement is uh, I'm playing music at the Dorset Playhouse. There is a fundraiser next Saturday. If anybody's interested in going, I think the tickets are $50, um, which comes along with hors d'oeuvres and drinks and so on. But if you're a fan of the Dorset Theater, the Dorset Players, uh, it's a fundraiser to support them. And it should be a fun evening. Um, and one more thing is that um, we're going to have some emergency contact forms out next week for signups, just so that we can have emergency contacts for anybody here in case we need to get in touch or we need to um, coordinate anything in the case of an emergency, just as a thought, as a precaution looking ahead. So that'll be available next week for signups, and we'll announce that again. Um, next, Olavi has a, uh, uh, something from the church council that he'd like to present. appreciation for your seven years service as the moderator for the church. Significant appreciation to you, God. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And uh, Sandy has a couple of announcements as well. Thank you for all you've done for this church, Sue. Um, I put in the bulletin that bone builders will be starting at the in Bailey Hall on Mondays and Wednesdays, but I didn't put the date when they will start. It'll be the Monday after Thanksgiving, which is the 27th. And there are three cards out in Bailey Hall, if anyone would like to sign. One for Jeff McConnell, one for Louise Smith, and one for Kathy Mandeloni. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more announcements? Okay. Thank you for being here this morning to engage in worship together. We'll begin our worship with our intro, which is sung. It's number 2068 in the Black Hymnal. <laughs>
may be seated. Please join me in the call to worship. This is Psalm 70, printed in your bulletins. Be pleased, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be appalled because of their shame, who say, Aha, aha. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. Let's join together in singing hymn 723, Shall We Gather at the River? In the red. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Joshua. You have the people of Israel that are now in the promised land, and there's been some division among them. And Joshua speaks. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if you be unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I love that line from Joshua. I just want to read it again. This is a real statement of faith. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered Joshua, saying, 
Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. And then Joshua said, Then put away the foreign gods which are among you, and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and made statutes and ordinances for them at Sechem. The word of God. So, do we have any children here today who would like to come down? I can pass it to you. Hello, good morning. How are you doing, Charlie? You doing okay? Yeah, you doing good? Hey guys, hello. I want to I want to tell you a story today. Okay. Rings. Oh, rings, beautiful. Okay, I used to live in a place called Los Angeles, California, and one thing Los Angeles is known for lots of things, but one thing it's known for is earthquakes. You know what earthquakes are, right? Yeah. Earthquakes is. Yeah, just like that. It's really exciting. Tectonic plates. Tectonic, tectonic oh, plates. Yeah. Stop, um, yeah. When they, when, when they get apart. Yep, and they, they break apart and the earth shakes. And when I was a boy, I was in Los Angeles, and we had a, we had a great big earthquake. You have to stay still mm -hmm. until it's over. You stay still until it's over. That's right. You have to be very careful, and you don't, you don't want to be near the windows with glass breaking and all these kind of things. So one day, I was in Los Angeles, and all of a sudden, the ground started shaking. And then the lights went out. Like that. I mean, oh, no, what are we going to do? The lights were out. Ah. And luckily, we were always prepared. We kept a lantern around. We kept some flashlights and some lanterns. So if the lights went out, we would, in the middle of the night, we, we could find our way. We'd go around, and we'd look, and we'd see. And we'd make sure everybody's OK in the house until the lights came back on. And then we would check on everybody and make sure we were okay. And then what we would do is we'd go to our neighbor's house and we'd check on our neighbors and make sure they were okay. And we'd look around and, and make sure things were all right with everybody. And one thing that we had to always be care make sure in Los Angeles is that we were prepared for an earthquake. So not only do we have our lights in case the lights went out, but we'd have other things like we'd have some food, we'd have some water, We'd keep some of those things in our car in case we were driving away from home when the, there was an earthquake. Science teacher had lived in an earthquake before. Yeah. yeah. But it was a very, very small one. Yeah. We, couldn't stop moving his foot because of Yeah, yeah. It's a, quite an experience. It's quite an experience when the ground shakes under your feet and you realize that, oh, nothing's stable. It's a, it can be quite scary. But one thing that takes away the fear from that is knowing what to do. So we're in an earthquake. If you know how to behave and if you have some preparation, then you're, then you're not so worried. And the main thing, though, too, at that point is that I had a family, my parents and my brothers, and we looked out for each other. And then we looked out for our neighbors. And we looked out for everybody else. And we were able to calm down and then be helpful to others. And so that was a really important lesson for me. And today, what I want to talk to you about, though, I just want to tell you there's other ways of being prepared. We look out for our brothers and sisters. We listen to our parents. And then we try to get through some of the tough times together. We look out and we care for each other. That's one of the important things. 
And so in the Bible, there's a, there's a story where Jesus says, the person who built their house on a rock, they were safe. When the floods came, the house was stood still. It didn't move. And there was someone who built their house in the sand. And that was very foolish because the floods came and the whole house went like that. Because the sand moves, right? So understanding Jesus and following Jesus is like building your house on a rock. It's like being prepared. It's like having a light just in case the lights go out. You want to be ready for that. So let's say a prayer together before we go to Sunday school, okay? It's like having food in your back pocket if you want to wake them up. Yeah, food in your back pocket. That's a good thing to have. <laughs> okay, let's, let's say a prayer together. Dear God, we thank you for this day and for this time together. We ask you to help us to prepare ourselves, prepare ourselves in mind and body and in spirit to be ready to open our hearts to you, that we may be loving and be wise in all things and prepared. Amen. Thanks for joining me. Have a great Sunday school. I've heard of fairy tales. Yeah. Fuzzy tales. No, you have to. Veggie. Veggie tales is new to me. Yeah. We could go on. Um, <laughs> well, now as we, we enter into our time of prayer, um, is there anyone that we'd like to lift up in prayer this time? I'd like to remember my friend, Leslie Dockery. Okay. Keep Leslie in prayer. Donna. My friend, Kate Hattie Hustler. The family of my cousin Larry Central passed away this week. Larry's family. Yes, sir. My daughter Katie. Yes. Second surgery on her. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, John. We pray that you contact all the people who will be the Thanksgiving meal. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sandy. Uh, continue prayers for Jeff McConnell. Louise Smith and Kathy Mataloni. Yes. And um, my friend Gene passed away a couple days ago on Friday. So I'll keep his family also in our prayers today. Okay. As we enter into our time of prayer, I would invite you to breathe deeply, to still your hearts, still your minds. I'm going to read a poem, and then we'll enter into our time of silence. It's a poem called The Peace of Wild Things by Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound, in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light for a time. I rest in the grace of the world and am free.
Gracious God, we gather here today to worship you, to give you thanks and praise, to offer up our hearts and all the cares that we carry, all the burdens that the world has put upon us and the burdens that we put upon ourselves. We offer them to you. And we offer our lives to you. We thank you for this time of life, for the seasons of life. As the forests go to sleep and all things quiet and the days get shorter, we live in anticipation of the light coming into the world. We prepare ourselves by walking with you, by studying your word, by looking for the Christ light in our neighbors and in ourselves and in all creation. We thank you for the spark of the divine that you have bestowed upon us as part of this earth that you have made. We think about our sick and wounded brothers and sisters. We ask for your healing upon them as your healing spirit is working among us always, that we may open ourselves to your healing and allow ourselves to be healed. We ask you to watch over Katie, help her to recover, be with her as she goes into surgery, strengthen her and her family around her during this time, that it may be a time of hope and healing for all. We ask you to watch over Kathy Madaloni, watch over Jeff McConnell, we ask you to be with Louise Smith. Surround them with your healing light. We ask you to be with Leslie Dockery and Hattie Hustler and Kevin Bishop. Bless and surround them with your healing light. We ask for your comfort and your healing spirit to be with Larry's family and with Jean's family and with all the families that are suffering from loss now. May we come together in times of remembrance and your presence be with us in these moments. As we enter into the season of thanksgiving, we give thanks for all that we've been given. And we think of those who are not as fortunate, those who suffer from hunger. We ask that all of those who don't have enough to eat will find good meals at this time of year and that those of us who have will be connected with them so that we may share in our abundance. We ask you to watch over the war-torn places of the earth May your spirit of peace be in the hearts of men and women. May you protect children from violence and protect all those who are vulnerable. We ask you to watch over those who are in prison, those who are in schools, that they may learn well. We ask you to watch over those in hospitals and those in nursing homes. Watch over the children who are being born this day and on all those who depart. We thank you that we share this moment in time together, this moment of life that we may worship and seek your presence. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. You taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So now is the time that we offer out of our abundance our tithes and gifts. created heaven and earth and all things. You've created us and given us the gift of life. We thank you for these gifts and all the blessings you bestow upon us. We ask that you receive our gifts and tithes, that they may do good in the world and help others. Amen. <laughs> Now for our scripture readings, our first reading that Olavi is going to do is from the Wisdom of Solomon. It's a book that's not found in most Protestant Bibles, but it's, it's part of 
the non-canonical texts that you'll find in Eastern Orthodox and, and in other, other Bibles. So this is called the Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom is radiant and unfading, and she is easily discerned by those who love her and is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. One who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty, for she will be found sitting at the gate. To fix one's thought on her is perfect understanding, and one who is vigilant on her account will soon be free from care, because she goes about seeking those worthy of her, and she graciously appears to them in their paths and meets them in every thought. The beginning of wisdom is the most sincere desire for instruction and concern for instruction is love of her. And the love of her is the keeping of her laws. And giving heed to her laws is assurance of immortality. And immortality brings one near to God. So the desire for wisdom leads to a kingdom. Today's Psalter is Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7, found in your bulletin. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generations, for the mercy of Jesus the Lord and his mind. And while they receive Jesus God. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. So the generation said, O God, and not have to forget the words of God, but the Jesus and the The Gospel lesson today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. It's called the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. The ten young women took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those young women got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some of yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other young women came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Thus ends the reading. So I was in the Boy Scouts when I was a kid, when I was just, uh, growing up in New York City. Um, if you don't know, the Boy Scout motto is be prepared. And so I was learning how to tie knots and pitch a tent and have everything that I needed for a camping trip in my backpack. 
I also learned to carry a knife or some way to make fire, always being ready for, for things. But the best lesson I got in preparedness happened one afternoon outside the church. Um, well, yeah, the church, and then there was the parish house next to it, and then the parsonage was next to that. And the parish house is where we had our Boy Scout meetings and our Sunday school and the church offices were there. So um, that's also where I lived, right next door. But there was a meeting or something going on this one day, and the sidewalk outside this area, it was New York City, and there's big trees, and the sidewalk was all buckled up every which way. And um, I remember hearing, uh, I remember, I didn't see what happened, but I remember hearing somebody cry out that somebody had fallen down on the sidewalk. And I went over, and it was an old man, I didn't recognize him, and he was laying on the sidewalk, and he had blood coming out of his nose. And uh, he wasn't moving. He was just laying there. And I heard people saying, oh, no, what are we going to do? And so I heard somebody say, get Mike, get Mike. And then a moment later, I saw the crowd that was forming. It parted, and, and Mike walked up. Now, Mike Pelagato was our, our scout leader. He was a Boy Scout uh, leader, the guy. He was a mechanic by trade. He was tall and wiry, short black hair. He had a face that looked like a desert canyon. You know, this weather beaten. He chain smoked Marlboro cigarettes and he cussed like a sailor. And he was incredibly fair, really direct with us, very honest. He had high expectations and we knew that he would always shoot us straight. So this guy had our undying love. As young boys, we all loved him and looked up to him. He also had eight fingers. And if you asked him what happened to your other two fingers, he would say, well, I got in a fight with the wall and the wall won. So there, there was always mystery surrounding Mike as well, too. You didn't know quite where he came from. Um, he seemed like he was, he was a little otherworldly to us. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so this guy was laying on the ground and bleeding, and the crowd parted, and up walks Mike. And as Mike walks up, he's taking off his sweater, and, he's take, and he takes off his T-shirt. He has a white T-shirt on, and he takes that off, too. And he, putting his sweater back on. As he's walking up, I see him doing this, and he turns somebody, call 911. Hey, you, grab something, grab a pillow, and get a blanket if you can from inside the church, bring it out. And he's, he's giving instructions as he's walking into the situation. And then he goes and he kneels by the old man, and he takes the white T-shirt that he just took off his body, and he, and he puts it to his nose, and he holds him, he talks to him, you know, and, and he starts to make him comfortable. He's assessing, is there anything else going on? Are you okay? And, and in this crowd of people who didn't really know what to do, some of them kids, some of them adults, Mike was this calming force. Somebody is out there calling 911. A moment later, the ambulance come, the paramedics, they take care of the guy, and the guy was okay. He just had a bloody nose and, and, a, and a bit of a fall and a scare, but he was okay. Um, that was an unforgettable moment for me. Um, partly because Mike really showed us what it meant to be prepared. It was more than I could have learned from the Boy Scout handbook or from a lecture or anything like that. I saw it, a living demonstration in a moment of crisis. I saw him take action, and it taught more to me than, than I think anything else could have at that time. Um, part of that was that what was more important than having a first aid kit or anything, anything special equipment Mike had his wits about him. He had studied first aid, obviously, but he also knew how to be a calming presence. He knew how to attend to this person right there in the moment and what to do. He was helping a neighbor in need. And so he, he was sort of the first aid kit. He was this embodiment of preparedness and being ready. Now, the story in the gospel today is about being prepared. Um, it tells of 10 young women who are waiting for a bridegroom to arrive so that they can enter into a wedding feast. Weddings in those days were a big affair. Life was pretty humdrum, and maybe there weren't a lot of celebrations, a lot, not a lot of excess with poor people. And this would be a time, a lavish time. These would be highlights of somebody's life, not just the highlight of the bride and groom. This was, this was a big highlight for anybody else in the community to get together. So... These events were planned. They were highly anticipated. 
But it was a normal thing for the bridegroom to appear at an unexpected hour because the bridegroom would be traveling maybe to see family and village to village doing different things. And so you didn't know there was an unexpected element to it, although the whole wedding was planned. So the maidens with the lamps would have known about the wedding for some time. They would have had a chance to be ready, even if the bridegroom was delayed. The young ladies with the extra oil were prepared for a long wait, while the ladies without the extra oil were unprepared. But they didn't, it wasn't without warning. Now it's a really, I feel like it's a really tough image, this, this parable in a way, because I like to think of Jesus as being inclusive, the door remaining open, being loving, not locking anyone out of the kingdom. It's a, it's a tough kind of image for me. I, I, don't, I don't quite, I kind of grapple with that one. As the parable suggests, these five maidens who were, who were foolish, who were not prepared, were locked out of it. And, and you would hope that Jesus would be more forgiving. And I, I kind of hope that myself because I, I know how often I feel unprepared for things. And I don't want to be caught, you know, unawares. But I think the, the message is that if you are not prepared when the moment strikes, it's too late. It's too late when the moment strikes. And, and you need to prepare yourself beforehand. And if you have fair warning, you need to be prepared. If you think about that in life, nobody knows when the moment is, when their life may be over. Are you prepared for this? Are you prepared for a disaster to strike? Are you prepared for, for uneventualities? It's impossible maybe to prepare for everything, but prepare as much as you can. You do not want to be caught unprepared. So this parable isn't just about being prepared in the sense of the oil and the lamps. It's about a way of being there's a wise way of being, and there's a foolish way of being. As I mentioned earlier, the, the man who builds his house on a rock, the wise man, versus the foolish man who builds his house on sand, preparing, thinking ahead. In the Bible, the way of wisdom is equated also with the way of life, and the way of foolishness is equated with the way of death. And there are many, many passages in the Bible devoted to wisdom. The wisdom of Solomon, which we heard today, is all about that. It says, the beginning of wisdom is the most sincere desire for instruction. Desiring wisdom is the beginning of wisdom. Wanting to become wise, that's a wise thing in itself. And then it takes you through the, all the way through to, to, to wisdom leading to immortality, leading to the kingdom. It's, it's this beginning of the thread. If you desire wisdom, it leads you on to great things. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about wisdom. Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. It says, say unto wisdom, thou art my sister. Have a kinship with wisdom. Draw, it in, draw wisdom into your life as if it were a person. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Why is so much written about wisdom in the Bible? It's very foundational. It, the question, this parable, also in Matthew 24 and 25, the, these, these books that we're looking at now, they have to do a lot with the end times. So there's a sense of finality with, the, with these with the door being shut at the wedding feast. This is Jesus' last discourse. This first discourse was the Sermon on the Mount, where he talks about building your house on a rock. And this is his final discourse before his journey to the cross. So this is kind of his last bit of instructions. And they deal a lot with the end times. They're very much about being watchful and prepared. And incidentally, as we enter the time of Advent coming in, it's also a time of being watchful and being prepared. As, the, as these books talk about the end times, you also be prepared for the light coming into the world, which is the Advent preparation. Now, disaster scenarios and survival is one of these obsessions in our culture. There's so many movies, so many TV shows about the end times, so many so many things going on. Uh, the, the whole prepper, everybody familiar with preppers are? People who spend a lot of time and money preparing for disasters, having fallout shelters and, and 
basements full of canned goods and all kinds of stuff like that. It's a huge business nowadays, billions and billions of dollars. Um, and I think it, it, it speaks to our sense that our peace and our stability are quite fragile. They're quite singular. It's very special to have peace and to have something stable. There's a lot of work that goes into that, to having the lights on and running water and all these things that make our life sort of peaceful and stable so we can do other things. Even if we have not experienced disasters or tragedy ourselves, we know people who have, and we see people struggling on the news in other parts of the world constantly with different types of disasters. While it may be possible to go overboard with a prepper sort of mindset, um, which is often characterized by fear and lack, it's worth noting that there are positive aspects to it. It's wise to look ahead. It's wise to plan for the future. Disasters can come in regional or individual sizes. If you get a flat tire on a remote road going over the mountain where there's no cell service during a winter storm, being prepared can be the difference between a mishap and a personal disaster. But how do we prepare wisely for unforeseen events? And there's many ways to prepare wisely. This is sort of a, it's sort of a life thing, like seeking for wisdom. It's part of the life. That's, that's looking ahead and being present also. If we consider wisdom as a sense of being prepared in a loving, intelligent, and discerning way, we consider how to be prepared, and in that sense, to be wise. If we want to be physically prepared, we take care of our bodies through exercise, getting enough sleep. We have to manage our stress levels. We want to make our living environment as, as comfortable as we can, not a place that stresses us out, but a place where we can, we can actually take rest. We have to pay attention to what we eat and what we put into our bodies for nutrition. These are all important elements to physical health. And with good physical health, you're more prepared for other eventualities. To be mentally prepared for things, we might want to know some basic first aid. And this is an aside. If anybody's interested, talk to me. And I, I know some paramedics. We can have a first aid class here anytime. It's always available, so I can organize that if, if anybody's interested. That's, that's an aside, but talk to me if you're interested. Um, I know with cell phones now, we don't even memorize numbers anymore. As a kid, I, I could call all my friends. It was all in my head. Now I don't know hardly any numbers anymore. But do you have numbers memorized of emergency contacts, people that you might need to call in an emergency? As I mentioned earlier, we'll have a sign up for emergency contacts. I didn't mean to make that a plug for the, for the sermon, but it's, if we'll, we'll do that. We'll kind of have some emergency contact information here. So it's available for us too. So we know how to get a hold of each other and, and notify people if there's an emergency. But it's also important, we learned this in California with the earthquakes and so on, have an emergency plan. Have things worked out with friends. Have things worked out with the community, checking on our neighbors, looking out for each other. If you're okay, you can go look at our neighbors too and make sure they're okay. These are all wise things to do to prepare ahead of time for things that may happen. So there's circles of preparation and I could go on and on about it. There's personal and there's family preparations, there's financial and there's communal aspects to the whole thing. But um, I just wanna make one more point this morning and that's actually the most important thing, more important than all the other preparations combined. And that's what the passage that Matthew talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, building your house on the rock. It's about having enough oil for our lamps, extra oil. It's about following the way of Jesus. It's about listening to his words and doing them, preparing yourself and having a relationship with Jesus in a way. And we have a relationship by following him, by, by doing the things that he spoke about and walking the way that he walked. And the world may say that that's a foolish pursuit, in the ways of the world is very foolish. The world will say it's more important to have six months supply of canned goods in your basement or two years supply of cash in your mattress. But that's the world and to the world, it's only matter that matters. But we came here to seek the spirit. And we know that there's a spirit that, that imbues us with life and the spirit is the true reality beneath all matter. Jesus said, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek God, and everything else that you need will be provided. 
That is the path of wisdom, and that is the path of life. And as a boy, I saw in my scout leader, Mike, a model of preparedness and cool confidence during an emergency. That was an important thing to witness. Witnessing it meant more than, than being told about it. I saw it. But now as a man, I bear witness that Christ taught and Christ healed and Christ faced death on a cross so that we may have life in abundance, true life. So it seems to me that wisdom is not a destination. Wisdom is a pursuit. It's a relationship with seeking neither facts nor knowledge in themselves, but it's a blending of intelligence and love with divine truth. Wisdom is about developing good judgment, developing common sense and discernment, and not persisting in whatever foolish ways we may be pursuing at various times. We all have this model to follow in Jesus. Following Christ with all our hearts is the wise preparation that is the foundation of our lives. Amen. And I'm realizing, did I forget a hymn, Mary? Yeah. Yeah, I did, didn't I? I was not prepared for the, uh, I was not looking at my thing. Well, everybody feel okay with singing two hymns? Just do it back to back. We'll, we'll just get up and sing. That way we don't have to be up and down. Um, hymn number 474, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. All right, hymn 163, ask you what great thing I know.
you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Go in peace and may the light of Christ be with you always. Amen. Thank you.